Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Photoshop Show. It's almost my favorite holiday, and I couldn't resist wearing my mask straight from Venice. I hope you can hear me, and I'm not too muffled. Maybe I will take it off just for that reason. Hi, everyone. <laughs> oh, Jan, hello. It's me, Jan. <laughs> Isn't Halloween a great holiday? You can be whoever you want to be. <laughs> So somebody has a ghostly noise <laughs> behind them. There we go. Um, this is Jan Kavili, and I am here to welcome you to the Photoshop Show. Tonight, our special guest is Mr. Sean Duggan. Sean Duggan is a very famous author and Photoshop instructor, and we're very happy to have him back on the Photoshop Show. We also have the wonderful Sandra Parlow down there in our panel, and my co-host, the inimitable, how's that for a good word, Ron? The inimitable, <laughs> Ron Clifford. <laughs> Hi, Ron. So, can you guys all hear me um, in your Google stream? Because it's all quiet over here. Can you hear yeah, fine? you are a little quiet, but I hear you fine. All right, I'll get closer Coming to through you. through loud and clear. Cool. Well, you know, at the beginning of the show, I usually show a Photoshop or Lightroom technique. But this week, instead of doing that, I want to share um, something that I ran into that tripped me up for a while and once I got it all straightened out, I thought, gee, I wonder if this would help other people too. So if it doesn't help you, fine, but it might help you. <laughs> and that is the following. You know, I like to take my Lightroom with me, uh, my Lightroom, <laughs> my Lightroom <laughs> catalog <laughs> with me wherever I go because I'm working in different places a lot. And I think that's true of a lot of us now. You know, we go to different clients' offices, um, we're home, we're at, in the studio, you know, we're all over the place. And for much of the time I'm working on Macs and so I've always been able to just make a copy of my Lightroom catalog and my Lightroom photos, put it all in a great big hard drive and drag it around with me and then I can plug into any Mac and use my Lightroom catalog wherever I am. Well, it so happened that I had to use that catalog on a Windows machine and I got it all plugged in and I opened it and I could look at all my photos but guess what? I couldn't do anything to them. Who knows why? Can you think of why? Yeah, I don't know why. It's I know, and, and I wasn't sure either, and I think a lot of people don't know this. You have to have your drive formatted so that it can be read and written to by both Mac and Windows. And that means a different kind of formatting. So that's I thought it might be useful to show you kind of what the solution was um, so that you can get set up to do the same thing. Now, I know you Mac users are like, what the? I'm never going to Windows, right? <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> you never know when you're going to have to, especially like Sean, you know, you go to talk places and teach different places. Um, you know, people like you and me, we got to be ready for, for anything. So um, let me show you what, uh, what the solution was. Now, I didn't come up with the solution myself, and I don't claim to be an expert in it, um, but I can show you wh what one way around that problem is. The first thing you've got to do is get all of your stuff off of the external drive you're going to use or go buy a brand new one, one of the two. Um, because what I'm going to do is going to wipe the drive clean. Yeah, I know. So you want to be really careful not to write over your photos and I don't want anybody saying, oh, Jan Kabili showed me this and then I lost all my photos, right? <laughs> so we're not going to do that. Hey, Ron, will you check if I'm showing on screen? Right now I see only you. I have I you right on my screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, maybe I'll just share my screen actually and I'll show you on my Mac um, what to do. Hang on. What am I doing wrong? Oh, I know. I got to put this down. And go like this. Okay, now do you see my finder? Yes. Okay, so. Um, after I got all the stuff copied off of that drive, I had to go in there and reformat it to a different format. So on the Mac, I went to Applications and Utilities and DiskUtility.app, which is an app that comes with your Mac OS X. And here's what it looks like when it's open. Has anybody seen this before? No? No. Yes. <laughs> John has, yeah. Frequently. Okay, so 
it's a pain, you know, but it's actually can be really useful. Now you have to be careful here, as I said, and I am not going to erase this drive because this really is my good drive, but I'll show you what I would do if I were going to um, erase it so that I could reformat it so that it would be both readable and writable with my Lightroom catalog on Windows and Mac. Um, so you can see that the drive I have, first I select the drive I want over in the left, in the column on the left. And this particular drive I only had set up for Mac. And the good format if you're only going to use a drive on Mac is Mac OS Extended Journaled. Is that too small to read or can you read that? Barely read it. All right, well, it's a little small. That's what it says. So. Um, if I want to use this on both platforms, I can either from this drop, oh, here's what I would do. First, I can either click Erase or I can go to the parent drive and partition the parent drive. And that means like, so I've got this big drive called Seagate and I have broken it in as if it were two separate drives. One drive is just where I back up my MacBook Air and the other drive is the one on which I keep Lightroom and all my Lightroom photos. So if I were working with my big parent drive like that, um, I would have a choice of either erasing the whole thing and reformatting the whole thing or going into partition where I could um, format just part of the drive to hold my Lightroom photos and my Lightroom catalog. Do you understand what I mean? And then reserve the rest of the drive for whatever other purpose I wanted. And I like to set up my drives like that because I'm sick, you know, I don't like to spend money on drives. <laughs> so I try to use every bit of them. Um, so we'll do it in the partition place, but you could do it back in the erase place as well. All right, so now here um, I would set up my partitions the way I want them by coming to this menu and choosing how many partitions I wanted. I could have just one, I could have two, and that's the way I've got my drive set up. Um, and then I would choose, I would click on whichever partition was going to hold my Lightroom photos, and then I would erase that partition. Make sense? Hello. Yep, makes sense. Okay. Now, when I do, I would have the ability. Oh, let me see. Can I do it from here? Yeah. When I do that, I would have the ability to choose the format. And from the format menu, I can change from the one I've been using for my Macs to a different format that's readable and writable on both Macs and Windows. And that can be either MS DOS FAT or XFAT. Now, from what I've been reading, XFAT um, is better because XFAT doesn't have the same limitations that the MS-DOS FAT has. With MS-DOS FAT, you're limited to the size in, in file size so that a single file can't be larger than four gigabytes. So that means if you had like some video that you were trying to keep on there as well, you might, be, you might have trouble. I've also read, although I haven't tested this, that if you format to MS-DOS FAT, you can't use Time Machine on, uh, on the Mac side. So the way that we did my drive was XFAT. So I would choose XFAT here, and then I would give the drive a name, whatever I want it to be. You know, maybe it's going to be uh, Jan's Lightroom drive or something like that. And then I would click Erase. And that would reformat the drive and put it in the XFAT format. Make sense? Yep. Not too complicated. All right, I'm going out of there because I don't want to, by mistake, reformat my good drive. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that would be really bad. Okay, so now... I, I did that once, actually. Oh my God! And while you were doing a demo? No, no, that would have been really bad. Yeah. No, it wasn't while I was doing a demo. It was um, I had two drives that were both by the same manufacturer, so they both said, you know, the the manufacturer's oh, yeah. name, oh. and, and then below that, of course, was the the more custom name I'd given to the drive, and they were both the same size, and I mistakenly clicked on the wrong one and formatted it. Fortunately, yeah. fortunately. Um, most of the stuff was, you know, backed up on other drives because I'm pretty paranoid about my backups, uh, and I like to have, you know, more redundancy than not. So it, it, I did lose some stuff, but nothing that I could really uh, identify what I lost. It was one of those drives where it had a lot of old stuff on it, and it was kind of like, well, hmm, what did I lose on there? But yeah, you know, having multiple copies is so important. So this external drive that I drag around with me that has both my Lightroom catalog <laughs> and all my Lightroom photos is not the only copy of that stuff. That's just one copy of all that stuff. Um, so anyway, after you've made your Lightroom, or made your drive, you've reformatted it into that XFAT um, format, then 
you can drag your Lightroom catalog and your Lightroom photos back onto the drive. And as long as they're in the same relationship one to the other, um, when you start up that Lightroom catalog from any computer, everything should be linked up fine. But in the event that it is not, and I found that on Windows, sometimes it was not. I'll explain why in a moment. Then you're going to have to update the link between your catalog and your photos. So the way that I would do that is go to my folders panel in Lightroom, and I would click on the uh, on kind of the topmost folder. And so it's really important to set your um, your Lightroom or the photos that you use in Lightroom to get them all into one parent folder so that you can do things like relink the whole thing at once without having to go down into individual folders. So I go up to the top, um, which would in this case be this folder called 1.2 terabytes, and right click and choose update folder location in Lightroom. And then from there, you can go and find wherever that, um, you know, wherever your actual folder like that is that contains your photos on that external drive. Make sense? Yeah, yep. perfectly. Okay. And that will get everything back linked up into Lightroom. Now, the qu so I was wondering why is it all becoming unlinked and I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized what was happening is when you open a, um, your Lightroom catalog on Windows, sometimes Windows changes the drive name, which is like, what? You know, thank you very much. Um, but it does do that because I guess Windows assigns drive names to all the different devices that are attached and if it's used up a drive name like you know the D drive then the next time around it'll when you plug in your external drive it calls it the E drive yeah, and the next time the next it calls drive. it the F drive yeah. right and then Lightroom doesn't know that Lightroom doesn't know that it changed from E to F so that's when you have to do your relinking up now the last thing I'll say about this is I asked Windows people there must be a way to make that not happen and what they told me is you can actually in Windows at least in Windows 7 if you can get into a place called disk management there's a place there where you can assign a drive letter to your external drive and to further it and, and that should help from getting you know having Windows change the drive letter on you um, and then for further insurance, also in Windows, you can give, you can assign a name to the drive from right there in Windows, and you do that apparently from your uh, your general properties. You know, when you right click on the drive and then you choose um, general and you choose properties. So if you do all of that, hopefully you won't have the same problems that I had, which is not being able to write to my Lightroom catalog uh, when I attach my external drive to Windows. And the second problem, even if I, after I got everything reformatted, still finding question marks on my folders because um, Windows had changed the drive letter on me and I wasn't sure what was happening. Um, so those are the problems and, and those are the solutions that I found. I hope that helps those of you who need to go back and forth between Windows and Mac. And I think that's happening for more and more of us these days because we have, what's that word, a peripatetic work society now, right? Whoa, there's a big word. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm coming back to you guys. I hope. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> Did you leave a trail of breadcrumbs? I don't know. Oh, here's. I see Ron's smiling face. There. <laughs> trail You're of back. breadcrumbs. There you Everyone. are. All right. So I expect you all to be doing that. Now we have to be Windows experts too. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. nothing ever stays the same. <laughs> I know it doesn't. It doesn't. So, you know, um, I'm not the only one here tonight. We also have Mr. Sean Duggan. And Sean Duggan is an author. So, um, and he just had a new book published that he co authored with another very well known uh, Photoshop expert, Katrin Eisman. And you have a third author, too, don't you, Sean? Who's the third guy? Yeah, uh, James Porto is the. Uh the third author, and he has been a um, commercial photographer and compositing expert um, working out of New York City for the past uh, 25, 30 years. He used to do really um, intricate and detailed composites uh, before Photoshop, you know, with multiple negatives and pin registration and everything like that. So he uh, brings a lot of experience uh, on the commercial end of compositing to the book, and uh, we were grateful that he joined us on this, and his uh, uh, additions and contributions have made the book a much better 
uh, body of work. We're really, really pleased with that. Well, that's really great. And we keep saying the book. What is the name of the book? The name of the book is Photoshop Masking and Compositing. And what's it about mostly? I mean, the title kind of says, but how would you describe it? It is um, a really in-depth guide to uh, creating multiple image composites. So where you take uh, more than one photograph, uh, take parts from one photograph, parts from another photograph, bring them together and create a new uh, unified whole. And so it is pretty in-depth. It goes into um, a lot of selection work because, of course, when you need to uh, take something from one photograph and bring it into another photograph. You have to make a selection of it, so it goes into selections and masks in a lot of detail, layers, blend modes. Um, so it really is a, and it also covers uh, things you need to know about thinking about composites, such as you know, well, what's the uh, the lighting need to be in all of the photographs? What uh, what does the perspective need to be? It covers using photographs you've already taken that maybe you took uh, with no idea that you were going to use them in a composite, as well as creating photographs from scratch. You know, starting out with a sketch of what the composite is going to be like, and then bringing, uh, sh making those shots in the studio, and bringing everything together and tying it all together with kind of unified lighting and color treatments and things like that. And what about masking? It must have a bunch on masking too. It does, it does. Um, it's got about two full, two long chapters on just selections and uh, a couple chapters on layer masks and layers. So, um, and that's what I'm going to be showing uh, some of tonight, uh, some, some techniques from, that are showcased in that book. I'll be using some uh, images from the book as well as some other images to showcase some of those. Oh, great. I can't wait to see. You know, um, I've written a couple of books myself, and I was surprised at what the process was. And I'd be interested in hearing from you a bit about the process. What's involved in writing a book like that? Well, uh, a, a lot of hard work, um, and also, um, you know, a, a, a big team of people that extends beyond just the authors. You know, they, we have uh, uh, the team at Peach Pit Press uh, and our. Uh, acquisitions editor, uh, Nikki McDonald. She was great about, you know, keeping us, uh, well, trying to keep us on time. <laughs> we didn't do such a good job about that, but um, there's a lot of back and forth. We start with an outline, um, and that outline was initially based on the first edition of the book, which came out in 2004, I think it was, or 2005. Uh, and then, you know, we modified that uh, to accommodate the new stuff we wanted to cover. And then we just decide, you know, okay, who's going to write what chapters? And, you know, we dive in and write them, start illustrating them, coming up with tutorial exercises, finding the best images that will work for them. And then we start handing the chapters around between the three of the authors, and we all, you know, make, make suggestions and go back for another pass. And it's just a lot of that back and forth, uh, a lot of fine-tuning and massaging and, um, it's uh, it's a lot of work, as you well know, having done it yourself. Um, but it's uh, it's certainly very rewarding once you see the first box of books show up on your your front porch, and you can open them up and actually hold it in your hands. Yeah, it is pretty exciting. I know. I used to tell my mother to go to the bookstore and visit my books. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I really like that. A, a fun little gratuitous thrill to go to the bookstore and go, hey, there's our book. <laughs> I know. But um, now, how, if you have three authors, how do you keep a consistent voice among the three of you? Do you have a style guide or something, or what do you do? Well, when, you know, with, with three authors, we're, we, what we don't do is we don't refer to ourselves in the first person like, I did this or I did that. So we're usually referring to ourselves in the third person, and we're sort of referring to, you know, the authors as a group, you know. So we, we try to... Uh, refer to, you know, uh, if I'm writing a chapter, I might refer to something that I did and I would just say, well, you know, Sean worked on an image and it, you know, needed X, Y, and Z requirements in order to make it look real. And, you know, Jim had a project where he did something similar, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of the voice and, and tone really comes from, you know, the outline. There's going to be differences, of course, in our, in our tone, and we're not trying to mask that, to use a pun. Um, but, uh, you know, we are trying to do our best to present just really good solid information for the reader in a way that is accessible and easy to understand so that they can go through this book 
and come out the other end with a really good grounding on making, you know, collages and multiple image composites. And what's new in the book that wasn't in the last version? You know, pretty much everything is new in the book. Um, I, I'd say that obviously a lot of the same techniques are covered because, you know, the, a lot of those techniques haven't really changed uh, since the first book. You know, things like working with layers and blend modes and selections and layer masks, etc. That's the same. Uh, there have been some improvements to some of the tools that you would use to uh, refine selections or refine layer masks and all that's covered. So it's updated for Photoshop CS6, but all of the examples in the book uh, are all brand new. So we pretty much threw out all of the old examples, um, and I'd say that about 99% of the book is just totally brand new. Oh, that's great because it's a great way to give a new look to a book, even if the basic stuff is the same. So yeah. that's a good, a good way. You know, um, I've heard, it, of course, writing a book is something a lot of people aspire to. And I think that uh, if you do write a book, people look up to you. You know, they go, okay, that guy must really know because, you know, somebody publishes a book and it's sitting over there on the books, you know, in the bookstore. Um, but I've also had authors telling me, oh, my God, it's so much work, and it's almost like uh, like a charity uh, endeavor, you know, because you know, I just can't live on the money that I make from a book. What is your feeling about that? Well, uh, it certainly is a lot of work, and uh, I've um, co-authored several books, um, uh, a few with Katrine Eisman. Uh, I've done... Uh, Back several years ago, I did co-authored several editions of the Photoshop Artistry series with Barry Haynes. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that was my first one back in the late. I didn't know that uh, was late, you. Late ninety, yeah, yeah. I got involved in that book in like nineteen ninety-seven. So, mm -hmm. so I've done it a lot, and and they are a lot of work. And you know, every time uh, after I finish a book, my wife always, you know, kind of like looks at me and says, "No more books." Uh, just because she she sees how much time they take, and and you know I'm down in my office, you know, pulling all nighters to get things done. Um, so it's, I, I suppose you know to be able to live off of it, it's probably um, you know you have to have volume, you have to have lots of books out, um, you know, and, and a sort of a constant progression of of new additions and updates to all those books. Um, if you only have, you know, one or two books, you know, it's not really, it's, it's a little bit, it's extra stuff, you know, it, it's not your main thing, it's a little bit extra, every quarter the royalty check shows up, and, and it leads to other things too, you know, it leads to uh, other speaking engagements, workshops, uh, writing assignments, uh, DVD projects, whatever, so it, it really is just sort of, you know, uh, one piece in the greater puzzle of, you know, how you uh, or in my case, how I represent myself as uh, as a photographer and a Photoshop um, expert, digital imaging authority, whatever. It really is kind of a um, a, a glorified calling card, if if you will. I mean, it's a lot more than that because you're able to through the book, you're able to share what you know, and you know people can read that book and work through the exercises, and they can become better at Photoshop, and you know, so it's it's empowering to them, but. In terms of, you know, what you alluded to earlier, it being kind of a charity project, it, it's certainly one of those things where uh, I don't really keep track. Uh, you know, I don't have like a little hourly timer that keeps track of how much time I put in on the book because if I did, I'd probably, you know, get really depressed or something. <laughs> Well, you know, my favorite thing that you said about it was that uh, when you said, oh, well, we didn't stay on our time schedule either. I don't think one author has ever been on the time schedule, and then they try to make all of us really bad. So I'm sure you shouldn't feel bad. <laughs> and I'm sure well, it's part, part of the reason we, uh, we, we, we kind of extended the time schedule is we, we realized um, when we were initially, you know, into it, we realized that Photoshop CS6 was coming soon, and we didn't want to put out a book that was written for Photoshop CS5, knowing that, you know, three months later, Photoshop CS6 was going to come out. So that's, you know, another reason why we, you know, kind of uh, decided, you know, begged and pleaded with the publisher to extend the schedule. And unfortunately, they, uh, they saw the reasoning behind that, and they were gracious enough to, uh, you know, accommodate that request. And, and I'm glad that we were able to put out a book that is current with the current version of Photoshop.
Yeah. I am too. And I, I just want to say, if you guys are wondering why I'm going on and on about this, this is like, in my mind, this is the book. I mean, there just aren't very many seminal books out there anymore. And this one is. And I've been consulting, you know, edition one, which is kind of long in the tooth for a long time. So when this book is out there, Masking and Compositing um, by Katrina Eisman and Sean, Sean Duggan and Ron Porto, you've got to go get it. If you're going to buy one Photoshop book, this is the one. Yeah, I'd speak to the fact that there's, I mean, there's a lot of people saying that the printed book is kind of dying, but in regards to learning things like Photoshop, the things that I truly remember about Photoshop and the techniques I'm doing are almost always the ones I learn through a book, not through watching a video. And so videos can be helpful, but having the printed page gives you just that little bit more. Um, so that's just my two cents on it. Well, I think that, you know, different people um, learn differently. And um, I think for, for anybody who is looking to uh, perhaps uh, get a book like our book or somebody else's book or perhaps, you know, um, maybe sign up for an online training course like those that Jan does through lynda.com, uh, I think it's really important to be familiar enough with yourself and, and know how you learn, you know, identify what are the, the methods, the learning methods and the teaching methods that resonate most with you and are the most effective for you because there's just many different ways to learn and just because, you know, you tend to gravitate more towards uh, one way or the other doesn't mean that one is, is better or worse, it just means that you need to identify well, what is the best method um, for me to learn and then, you know, kind of track down those uh, teaching solutions and learning solutions that will best fit with, you know, who you are as a person. And, you know, I think for me at least, it's always been multiple, diff I have to approach a subject from multiple perspectives. So I do like um, the videos, but I learn the most when I go to workshops, to be honest. And I know you lead workshops too. Mm -hmm. And then I need the book for the reference on the shelf. So if I just have to quickly look something up, you know, I can go right to it. So there are, you know, those three different methods, live learning, video learning, and books. Um, I'll compliment one another. I don't think it's either or. Right. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Well, do you guys want to know anything more about the book, or are you ready to start seeing some material from the book that Sean can show us? No, I mean, Let's see some stuff. Yeah, show us the stuff. <laughs> it's the good stuff. All right. So let me dive in. i got to share my screen. I haven't done this in a while. So it's going to ask me what to share. I think I need to just, what, share desktop? Is that desktop, what it is? Desktop, and then choose the application. Yeah, make sure your desktop's Share selected window. Okay. Yeah. And then we're going to see everything on your desktop for a second until you share the application. There, I see you, me. You see you? There we go. Do you see my bridge? There it is. All right. All right. Okay. So I'm just going to go through first, and I'm going to show um, a selection of uh, composites from the book. And um, some of these are going to be before and after, so you can see the, what the image looks like before, what it looks like after. And then I'm going to go and actually show you um, a few techniques um, in Photoshop for how to um, actually get a lot of bang for, for your buck in terms of not having to do too much work. So these are pretty um, simple techniques I'm going to show. Uh, so they're good for those of you who are new to compositing because um, they can get you pretty far with uh, not a lot of work. All right, so let me just start off with this one here, just a picture of an old uh, train in uh, Sacramento, California. And I turned that into something a little bit different there, added the cliff and the tunnel. This is a simple composite here, which is just a, more of a blend mode based composite, whereas, and by that I mean that most of the um, heavy lifting in the compositing was done using layer blending modes in Photoshop, and I will be talking about those uh, shortly when I go into uh, more of a hands-on demo. This is uh, just a straight shot here. This is not a composite, and the finished version, which you'll see here in a second. Actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll just put both of them up there on screen. That way they'll both show up side by side. Um, 
you can see that what I've done is I've just basically um, extended the arches of the bridge because I felt that the arches in the version on the left looked a little bit too far away from my uh, taste, so I just extended those and created uh, multiple arches to give more of a telescoping feel to it. And this is uh, one we'll be taking a look at uh, in Photoshop. Actually, a fairly simple composite. It's not too tricky. What is that thing? Is that what is that thing? Go back there. <laughs> uh, this thing here. What? Yeah. What is what thing? The the metal mat. It's a metal? it's a helmet. Oh. So it's a, uh, um, you know, like a, a a knight's helmet. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah, that one worked out pretty good. And you know, when I'm like. Um, making composites, a lot of times I, I, I take my images, and, and many of my images are not necessarily photographed for composites, although the helmet in this case was, but the landscape was not. So when I look at, at my images, a lot of times I'm sort of looking at them with an eye of, well, how can I make this different? Is there something about this scene? Could I place something in this scene that would be kind of interesting or uh, strange or, or whatever to illustrate a concept? And so a lot of, for me anyway, a lot of the compositing process involves looking at my images and imagining what sort of story that image can be a part of. So I have to look at it and, and basically extend the story of the image. Here's a good one for coming up Halloween, kind of a spooky, mm -hmm. spooky image there. And then this, um, I, my apologies that this is uh, a little bit small here. This, these are the component parts of this image down below. Uh, so if I zoom up, can you see that a little bit closer there? Let me just, nothing uh, happened. <laughs> nothing happened? For me. Okay, I guess not. I just wanted to see if it zoomed up uh, on the Google Plus uh, Hangout, but it didn't do that. Yeah, it doesn't work here. Okay. Anyway, um, so it's just this is just a detail, architectural detail of a cathedral roof. I mirrored it and um, stuck it together, and then I thought, well, gee, that kind of looks like some sort of a strange steampunk, you know, spaceship or something. So I crashed it into the uh, uh, desert of Death Valley. But you put that good shadow on it too, and that helps make it. I more did put the good shadow. Yeah. That was kind of a tricky one, you know, because when you're figuring out what to, how to do shadows in images, you always look at the the main image where you're placing your composite, and you look at what the shadows are doing there. And uh, this was, you know, pretty much midday uh, at Badwater in Death Valley, um, so there wasn't a lot of shadows. But there are very slight shadows along the little salt, you know, ridges here. So that was my clue as to which way the sun uh, was going. And that's a bit, I see that all the time where people make composites and they have shadows going in two different directions. Obviously, that wouldn't be happening in the real world. Well, maybe if you set up the lights that way. Yeah, and actually, this, this next example is a good um, uh, further example of that concept. Uh, all of these pictures, except for the building in the upper left, were taken in Death Valley, although they were taken in different parts of Death Valley. Um, but the the main thing that um, determined what the main sh shadow direction should be for the composite, which you'll see here in a second, is the, the shadows uh, coming from the uh, this little rope uh, line uh, on the side of the walkway here, and then the shadow of the person walking. So that meant that the sun had to be, you know, coming from uh, upper left. And so what I did is when I put the composite together is I actually, and you'll see this in a second, the, the two kind of canyon wall pictures in the lower left and the lower right, I switched them around to make the lighting consistent. And here is the resulting image here that came from that. Ooh. And so um, the shading and the lighting is all you know, um, it, it makes sense from a physics standpoint. You know, I'm, I'm basically the, the center image of the walkway and then the person walking, that is what determined what the direction of the, of the light should be. So are you this... Are you, are you a lover of science fiction? Uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a real hardcore science fiction geek. I do appreciate it. Um, and I like uh, 
what I like to do a lot of times in composites is create these sort of very cinematic looking scenes um, and, you know, coming up with scenes that look like they're out of, you know, some like a Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movie or some science fiction movie. It just, it, it lends itself to, to that kind of genre of image. Um, and and the, the images that I created for this book are um, kind of loosely gathered into a collection called Postcards from the Imaginarium. So that sort of fits in with, you know, uh, this picture here anyway. Um, which is sort of an imagined landscape. So I just want to get back to this uh, component um, selection of um, the parts for that other image there, because this building up here is the, uh, the, the Japanese Arts Pavilion at the LA County Museum of Art, and what I did was I made a selection of just the, the window structure, and that's what created these sort of strange, you know, monolithic uh, sculptural elements here kind of forming this gate but as part of the examples in the book I also did other things with it as well so here is another one uh, which is basically the building uh, pretty much straight and I'm placing it you know up on top of a mountain also in Death Valley or, or a hillside rather and in terms of perspective if you're thinking about putting pictures together the important part here is that um, when I took the picture of the building, I was looking up at it. So that meant that in order for it to work in another scene, it needs to be placed in a scene where I'm also going to be looking up at it. So uh, placing it here up on top of this uh, hillside uh, fit that requirement because I'm, I'm matching the perspective uh, in both shots. And, that's and just another like, thing, I think that's another thing people goof up a lot. Perspective yeah. is really important. Yeah, you have to take into account what's the perspective, what's the shadow like. Uh, here's another example of, of me using the same element from that same building um, and just playing with it. And again, I'm matching the light to what's happening with the planet uh, photograph. By the way, for those of you uh, out there in, in Google Plus land watching this, if you um, are interested in doing composites like this, um, you can get wonderful high-res images of space at the NASA website, and that's where these came from. And they are, you know, free to use, um, you know, there's no restrictions on them. It's kind of like, you know, one of those uh, fringe benefits of your tax dollars at work. That's good to know. Yeah, that's where I got these, so it's, it's, it's really fun. Uh, this composite here, I like this. Uh, I, I view it as kind of unfinished. Um, because I really think there needs to be more of a story behind it. So this is probably an element I will use in another, another composite probably. I'll just have this maybe in the background or something. But uh, um, so far it's a good start, but uh, it needs a little bit more of a story for, in order for it to kind of hook me and interest me. Just a simple, um, kind of more of a graphic design type composite here where I'm blending together. Uh, two very different elements putting the sheet music up into the sky. Uh, we'll take a look at a before and after of this one, actually show you how this image was built. This is another one of those uh, shots that um, falls under the heading of, you know, postcards from the Imaginarium. Uh, another um, tip for you in terms of uh, images that are sometimes interesting to use in composites is that the shipwreck there, actually it's not a shipwreck, but uh, the, the masted ship is from um, a royalty-free, or an, I shouldn't say royalty-free, but a public domain image from the U.S. Library of Congress. And uh, again, that falls under the heading of your tax dollars at work. Um, these are older historical images. Uh, this one was just of, of a ship in the harbor, and I made it look like a shipwreck, but uh, it kind of fit my purposes for this particular shot here. And okay, question, question. Can you put that in a book and still be okay? You know, uh, we, I've used the U.S. Library of Congress images uh, as an example in Real World Digital Photography, which I co-authored with Katrine Eisman and Tim Gray. And I used an example of um, a panorama shot taken in 1916, I think, 1915, of the Lusitania at, at Dock in New York. And if you're using the full image, um, 
then they like to, I mean, we gave them attribution, you know, and said this is where this image came from here. This image here is uh, a much older image, a historical image. There's no known photographer uh, attributed to it. It's just sort of an old image taken in the, the late 1800s. And it is in the public domain uh, because it's uh, well over 75 years old. In fact, this one's over 100 years old. Uh, so in, the, in, the, in this case, this picture of the ship, uh, yes, I can use it for that reason. But you do have to be careful about that. And I, most of my composite images, um, pretty much all of them, they are my own photographs. And that's just sort of a, a point of personal honor, I guess. I like to use my own photographs. And it's only when I just absolutely have, don't have anything um, suitable that I will go out and, you know, purchase a stock image or look through some old historical photographs. So when you're traveling, do you kind of keep this in the back of your mind? You take these kinds of shots or, you know, some backdrop shots, some close-up objects, stuff like that? Yeah, I do. And uh, a lot of my shots, composites come together. They're, they're not necessarily, like all of the elements in this uh, composite here, um, none of them were necessarily photographed for a, co a composite either a planned composite or a, you know, hypothetical, maybe one day I'll use this picture composite. Um, but I do do that when I'm photographing, I'll see something go, oh, that would be kind of interesting if I did X, Y, Z, and I'll take a shot of it. Uh, or, oh, this is really good for an idea I, I had, you know, a year and a half ago. And, and that happens sometimes. I was in Iceland uh, this summer uh, doing some location scouting for uh, an Iceland workshop that I'm going to be teaching next July. Um, I actually saw certain landscapes that would work very well for a composite that is sort of, um, I, I've already done part of the work on the composite. I just need a background to place this element into, and I haven't found the right background. Well, when I was in Iceland, I saw several scenes where it, it would work for what I needed to do. There had to be a, a specific vantage point and a certain height. Uh, in viewing the scene, and so for 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 that particular image, I did make photographs, knowing that oh, I'm going to try these out with this kind of composite that's already in progress. So I just have a quick comment on that, which is I always have to push myself on that. Um, if you are a landscape photographer, for example, I think you tend to take landscapes all the time or backdrops right. rather than getting in close and taking objects. So um, I keep making myself do the opposite of what I usually do, so that I have material to put together. Yeah, it's 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 good to do it, and and it, it can be hard sometimes because if you're trying to concentrate on one type of photography, uh, like landscape photography, for instance, it, it's sometimes hard to shift gears and concentrate on potential images that might show up in a collage, you know, down the road. So it really is sort of uh, two different kind of mindsets, and and some days I, I manage balancing those mindsets better than others. You know, I, I did notice. There were days when I was in Iceland this summer where um, I was, you know, kind of in the groove and it could seamlessly switch from shooting, you know, sort of a fine art landscape image to seeing something going, oh, that would be good for a collage. I'll just take a detailed shot of that. And then there were other situations where, I don't know, maybe the landscape was just so rich or things were, the light was changing so fast or whatever. I found it harder to kind of bounce back and forth between those two different mindsets, kind of schizophrenic in a way. How do you manage to keep track of what you've got in your stock? Oh, uh, good <laughs> question. Um, uh, keywords are key. Um, and that's, you know, I, I manage that in Lightroom. Um, I add keywords for uh, not only things that are, you know, in the shot, like, you know, for this picture here, obviously key, lock, etc. Um, would be in there, security maybe. But I also add keywords that, that might suggest things are a little bit more conceptual, um, uh, such as barriers or boundaries or, um, you know, more keywords that maybe are more psychological in nature that, you know, because if I keyword something correctly, um, if I get a request in for an image um, or somebody wants me to do some illustrations for something, I can just enter in the keywords and, um, you know, I can find the images very quickly and then get right to work, putting them to work in the collage. So keywords are, are definitely the way to go.
I totally agree. I'm doing. I'm, I'm recording a course about elements right now, and it's got uh, kind of like Lightroom. It's got a place for all these different organization features, and in the end, I'm convinced it's keywords because keywords are the way that you think. You know, mm -hmm. exactly. And whatever, like you said, barriers. I would never think of barriers, but that's what you think of when you're looking for a particular image. So, and I know people don't do it, but if you do it with every shoot, you know, you bring your shoot in, you keyword it, you're good. Well, and the other thing that I do in terms of composites, if I have uh, scenes that I know might be able to be used for a composite, if it's a scene where the vantage point is looking up, I'll put looking up as a keyword or looking down as a keyword. Because if I'm looking for a specific scene and the perspective or angle of view is pretty critical for what I need, I can search my, my looking up images or looking down images and see, ah, this is a good image that's looking down that'll work for that purpose. So I, I keyword for those things as well. That's great. I have such a hard time thinking of good keywords. Mine are all so basic. Flower, yeah. you know, building, like just tree. <laughs> well, keywording by using kind of really descriptive or emotive words, words help too. So. Yeah, you know, beautiful, pretty, exuberant, start using descriptives when you're using keywording because flower could be in the title or flower could be in the caption, but you start using those adjectives in your keywording and it really helps narrow down when you're looking for something. Right, exactly. So this image here, I'm going to show you another version of this image. This is, this is the image that actually appears in the book. Uh, it, it's not a step-by-step -step article in the book. It's more of just a, a standalone example. Um, image in the book and um, you know I have the city street image and I actually photograph the keys and the the lock specifically to put into this photograph uh, I don't have the, the source photograph of those handy but I, I basically set up these white cardboard boxes at the same approximate angles as the building and I lean the keys and the lock up and I photograph them uh, in my kind of little small tabletop studio but, you know, the image, I liked it, but it was missing something. It needed something more. So I've, I've been working on this image for a while now, and I, I keep playing with it and tweaking it. And I'll show you the, the current state of the image. It's, I'm, I like the direction it's headed in, but I've added a lot more to it, and so that's what I'll go to now. So it's quite a bit different now. Did that lose you guys? Nope. Never here. I was just like thinking it's person. it's much more moody now. Yeah, yeah, you've mesmerized us into submission. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the last time I was on here, I was talking away, and for some reason, <laughs> we dropped. Yeah, yeah I, I I got dropped out of the thing. I didn't know that I was not on. Like, yeah, so talking away for ten minutes to nobody. <laughs> yeah. So this <laughs> one here. Yeah, Sean, I ahead. should remind you that uh, Ron is reminding me to remind you that we're running a little bit behind time. So if you do want to show a technique, you might all right. Let's, yeah. Let me go and show a quick technique here then. Thank you, Dennis. Just about to do that. All right. Excellent. So uh, let me go and do uh, this one first. So the first technique I'm going to show, I'm going to show some short techniques, but they are techniques that have a lot of bang for the buck. Um, the first is actually uh, the same technique, Jan, that you showed on the very first edition of the Photoshop uh, show, which was uh, a gradient mask. So I have two layers here. I have the forest, and then I have this cathedral underneath. And I am going to add a layer mask to um, get this uh, layers panel out here separately so I can zoom up on it. I'm going to add a layer mask to the forest layer and just put a quick gradient in there. So I'll come down to the Add Layer Mask button down here. And I'm just going to grab the gradient tool. And I'm going to use a black to white gradient. So up in the gradient picker, the, the third swatch over is, is black to white. And I'll just use that. Now, in a layer mask, black is going to hide what's on the layer. Uh, white is going to show what's on the layer. And this layer mask is currently active here. So I will just drag up. And essentially what I want to do is I want to see... The, uh, the cathedral in the lower part of the image, and I want to see the forest in the upper part of the image. So again, making sure my layer mask is active, I'm just going to click and drag uh, in the image, and you can see how that creates a really nice blend there. That's very cool. 
And so that is like one of the easiest ways that you can blend two images together. Uh, you can come in with a paintbrush tool here, and I'm just going to paint on this layer mask to kind of get that tree out of the, the nave there so it looks a little bit more, um, looks better there. Now these two images work really well together because they both have strong vertical lines and so the trees almost look like they are coming out of the the columns and pillars inside the cathedral. But uh, a gradient mask is one of the quickest ways that you can blend two images together and depending on the images sometimes you can get two that really blend together very well and with very little work you can have a really nice composite here. All right, let me move on and show you uh, something else. Uh, let me just see what files that I have ready to go here. Um, here's another um, example of a gradient mask, something slightly different. I have this cl clouds layer sitting on top of a picture of a jar. Let me hide my video timeline. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a elliptical selection. So I'm just going to drag out an elliptical selection here. And I, I have that top clouds layer turned off just so I can see what I'm doing here because I want to basically have that elliptical selection inside the jar. And now I'll turn the clouds layer back on and I will add a layer mask. So once again, I'm going to come down to the add layer mask button at the bottom of the layers panel. And that's the third button in from the left. And I'll click that. So now you can see uh, what's happened here is that the selection has been turned into a layer mask. And where it's black, it does not show the cloud layer. Where it's white, it does. And I'm just going to go to the Properties panel. Now, if you're still using Photoshop uh, CS5, uh, you would go to the Masks panel. But uh, in Photoshop CS6, they've kind of done away with the Masks panel, and it's just a uh, a attribute of the Properties panel. And I'm just going to turn the feather slider up here quite a bit. There we go. So yep. this is essentially a gradient mask, even though it's not created by dragging a gradient from point A to point B. Here's what this mask looks like, and you can see that the place where it has been feathered is actually has you know a soft fuzzy gradient along the edges mm -hmm. so that's another a very useful way you can use um, a pretty simple mask technique to create uh, an interesting looking composite that's amazing <laughs> and, and you know the, 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 these are like the building blocks of composites you know a, a lot of the composites that I've been showing are, are pretty intricate and take a lot of work and there's a lot of really intricate masking but you don't necessarily have to, to if you want to start playing around with composites you can actually get in and start to have fun and make some really cool images with a minimum amount of work yeah and that's really important for people learning to be able to to have some success right at the beginning so do i have time how much time do i got yeah keep going keep yeah, going go ahead go ahead <laughs> okay. we can go a bit over that's okay all right all right so i've got uh, this is another quick one this is actually a composite that i did on my iphone all of this I did on my iPhone, so that could be a, a, a future uh, show, Jan, if you're, if you're interested. Wow, I think, I think we have another show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know what? You can't do it. You can't show the stupid iPhone app screen thing. On the, uh, there's no way oh, to yeah, because then you can't show the, the video. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, there may be a way around that, actually. But, but I, anyway, I, I, I could demo it in Photoshop showing you know how I did it. But anyway... So this is all done on the iPhone. This is the finished version. Let me just show you how I did this. And this all revolves around blending modes, which is the other main thing I wanted to show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab uh, my glass dome image. Where's my glass dome? There it is. So this glass dome image, first of all, was specifically photographed against a black background. And I did, I've already done some work here uh, modifying uh, the reflections so you don't see as much of the reflections up top. This is key because you can see that the reflection is ma mainly light areas and everything else is black. So I'm going to just drag that up onto my Highlands image in Iceland and drop it there. And let me zoom out so you can see that a bit better. So... Instant collage coming up here using only a blending mode. 
and the blending mode is multiply. So I'm going to go to the top of my layers panel where it says normal, a little menu there where it says normal. I'm going to open that up and I'm going to choose multiply. And I'm going to choose multiply, or excuse me, not multiply, I'm sorry, screen I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose screen because screen does not show things that are black. And I've got a lot of black areas. But screen does show things that are light. So watch what happens when I choose screen. Whoa! Fortunately, there I are some... an aha moment there. I've been doing this for <laughs> you know, Here I am, the guy that knows a bit about Photoshop, and I'm going, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> so when you, know these, when you know the behaviors of these blending modes, that's just a total, that's the keys to the castle. And when I saw that there were certain apps that had blending modes that I, I knew how they worked, it was like, oh, I know how to do that. So I'm going to uh, add a layer mask, and I'm going to do the same gradient mask trick that I did with the forest cathedral image, and I'm just going to hide the bottom part of this dome. There we go. Hmm. And I've got one other uh, thing to put in here. I'm going to take this sun flare image, and this is actually something that I rendered out of a, an app in... Um, on my iPhone and just to, to bring it in to show you how I did it uh, but I'm gonna bring that over into my Iceland image wait you have to tell us what apps these are on your iPhone <laughs> I was uh, just gonna say that <laughs> so for this one here the, the main app that I use is filter storm and filter storm has blend modes and layers and layer masks and it just made it incredible I mean I could do this composite on my iPhone in like less than five minutes All right, so I have, and then the the, the flare I used a um, an app called Lens Flare. And there's another one called Lens Light, which is similar. It does a really good job at adding flares to images. So this is going to be the same blend mode, the exact same blend mode, because remember the screen blend mode uh, shows light areas but doesn't show black. So if I just change the blend mode to screen, I can now take this and put that up at the top of the mountain and I'm done so um, blend modes are really useful especially I've got one more blend mode to show you if I have time it's kind of the opposite of screen but simple ways to uh, get a lot of bang for your buck and kind of jumpstart the compositing process as long as you have images that work well with those blend modes Yes, yes. Please show us. All right, right. Let me find my other one, which I was right, going to do. The, uh, so while you're showing this, I will say, you know, what I think is so wonderful about these demos is that they are simple. Um, and it is a matter of knowing your tools. I always tell people it's kind of like playing the piano. Once you get to the point where you just know where the keys are, it's amazing what sounds you can make, right? But you've got to practice. You've got to know, you know, okay, this sort of image or this sort of blend mode is going to work that way. Here's how you make the edges of the layer mask soft. It's not rocket science. It's just knowing some basic techniques. Right. Yeah, exactly. And having a, an imaginative mind and also looking at a lot of different resources to get ideas, too. All right. So this is an example from the book. Uh, this is going to be a, a, using blend modes that are the opposite of what the screen blend mode was. So again, for those of you who are, are watching who have not played around with blend modes before, um, the thing to remember about the screen blend mode is that it will show lighter areas, but it won't show black. So if you have lighter areas that are on black, uh, like I did here with the dome image, uh, it's going to show it very well. Um, this blend mode is going to take darker things, show darker things, but not show lighter things. So I have um, a layered file here of uh, the Windjammer ship. And then this is uh, a page from an old ship's log. And if I just change the blend mode to multiply, it will show the dark parts, but, but show the lighter parts less. So this page is not totally white, so some of it will show through, but it's not going to show much. And then I'm going to grab the sky here. And I'll just change its blend mode 
to something called overlay. And that allows some of that sky to come in here, but still show the ship. That's really neat. And I'm sure people have heard this, that you don't have to memorize these blend modes. You can just cycle through them. And yeah, just give them a try. Well, and the other thing to, to, to understand about the blend modes is that you'll notice, and this is probably really too small to see uh, on the version of this that's coming through in people's streams, but the blend modes are divided up into, into obvious sections. And so the ones that start with darken up here, um, the end result is typically going to be darker, but they are going to you know, give emphasis to the darker things in the image and not really show the lighter things very much. The light and blend modes, the, the, this group of five or six here, they're going to give emphasis to the lighter things in the image or on the layer and not show the darker things. And then the, the other ones which are useful are the overlay blend modes, particularly the first three, overlay, soft light, and hard light. They are going to combine both images or, or the top layer with all the other layers in ways that typically enhance the contrast. Uh, they show a little bit of each layer, but they do you do definitely get a big contrast boost there. And as you say, Jan, it's not rocket science. Just start playing around. You can't break anything and, and just have fun with it. So I, I do I don't know how we're doing on time. You guys can be my timekeepers. Well, we're kind of past the hour, so unless you have something that we absolutely have to see, we might want to stop soon. No, I, I don't really have anything that you absolutely have to see here. I think we can leave it at that. That's probably uh, as good a place as any to, uh, to stop. But, you know, if you uh, would love to show us more, you're always welcome back. I know you have a lot of great things to teach people. Um, I wanted to mention that um, what your work... I think the reason for me that your work is so wonderful is that you have a point of view in your work. You're not just slamming things together. Um, you know, if you look at almost any of Sean Duggan's images online, they all have this similar sense. They're a little bit supernatural. They look realistic, but there's something unrealistic about them. And that's why they draw you in. So I'm really, um, I wanted to compliment you on your artistic sense as well as your great Photoshop guru-ness. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. that. And I appreciate uh, the invitation to come back. It's always fun yeah. to come and, and hang out here. Ron and Sandra, got anything to add? I would just, um, you know, I think it's amazing how you can look at the different pieces and put them together in your mind and have an idea of what you want to do with it. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes it, it comes pretty quick. Other times, you know, I, I, I don't really figure out what the story is in an image until after I've actually kind of started to assemble it, like that picture of the, the padlock and the keys and the street and stuff like that. You know, initially that was just a padlock and keys in the city street. And um, as I've started to work with it further, it's kind of, you know, getting a little bit clearer to me uh, what the image is about. So sometimes you just have to sort of, you know, tinker around and, and see, see what you can find. And sometimes you find some interesting stories. And that's the, the fun part about it. Yeah. I always you know, like the aspect of creating a playground for your imagination. Um, this is just a wonderful demonstration of that, being able to use the tools at hand to create wonderful works of art that transcend photography as just a, a, a medium to record what's right in front of you, but to create something that's completely new and imaginative. And so that's what I, I get out of it. I just, I just love the tool as a way to create and to use as a playground. Yeah, it's fun. Definitely, definitely fun. I, I have a good time with it. Um, I wanted to mention something that is really related to my mind, um, and that is that there is a history of this sort of compositing work that goes way before Photoshop. I don't know, can you guys see my screen right now? Yes. Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Um, you know, one of the pioneers in this area, a guy who started doing this, like your co-author Ron Porto, way before Photoshop is Jerry Olsman. And I am so excited about a new uh, video on lynda.com that is really a film, not so much a, um, you know, a technical piece, but a film that shows Jerry Olsman's work and talks, you know, interviews him and talks about how he does things and also um, talks with his wife, Maggie Taylor, who's a Photoshop artist in her own right. And I love to see things like this because they give context the, to the kind of work that Sean is doing um, and that other Photoshop artists are doing. Uh, and actually, there's a history that goes back 
even before um, Jerry Olsman's work, you know, back into the way old days. And I've heard that there's an exhibit. Do you know where it is, Sean? Is it in New York City somewhere right now? Um, it's, um, it's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I believe it's called um, uh, Faking It. Um, and I don't know what the subtext is, but I think it's, you know, uh, something, something before Photoshop. That's right. And so if you are interested in this sort of thing, I would suggest, and maybe, Sean, you can give some more resources, too, you know, going back and looking at the work of old masters, the people who did this before Photoshop, um, uh, you know, photographers, and not only photographers, but painters as well. Painters have been doing this sort of thing for ages. Yeah. Um, and that will give you your own ideas. And, you know, I just want to point out one quick thing here. The, the picture you have on your screen there. Oh, you just you Oops, just sorry. It. Okay, there you go. There you go. You know, that, that's a picture of the house uh, kind of growing out of the tree roots. That's one of Jerry Ullsman's, uh, you know, most famous images. Uh, just to sort of tie it uh, back to some of the things that I was showing earlier, you know, the blending of the house with the tree roots, you know, of course, he, Jerry did it in the dark room, but uh, the way you would do it in Photoshop is essentially the same way uh, that I showed blending the forest into the cathedral picture, just a, a simple gradient mass to make the house blend out and blend into the tree stump below it. That's right. And imagine how many hours he spent in the dark room making that happen. <laughs> I've I've done stuff like that in the traditional dark room and it is a lot more work and, and you know, nobody nobody comes close to Jerry Olsman and doing that kind of stuff in the in the traditional dark room or even just, you know, you know, his his eye and his imagination and, and eye for, you know, uh, coming up with these wonderfully uh, evocative images that he makes. He's really been a big inspiration in, in my life. Yeah, he is really cool. And you know, um, I met him at a workshop at Anderson Ranch Art Center in Snowmass in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And it was really an honor to meet him um, and also to meet Maggie Taylor. Uh, so, uh, and that's a segue into talking about um, if you want to do a little promo for your workshops that are coming up, because workshops are such a great way to really meet artists and be inspired by them um, and go beyond just learning the technical parts of Photoshop. So, do you want to say something about your workshop, Sean? Well, uh, the, the big workshop I've got coming up uh, next uh, July is I'm going to be uh, leading a group in Iceland uh, for a workshop called Creative Discoveries in Iceland. And so that's going to be uh, from, I think, June 29th through July 6th, something like that. We'll have a full six days out in the field in Iceland. Uh, and we'll ha also have some digital darkroom sessions at the beginning and, and end, and also throughout the week as we can fit them in. Uh, and then I'm also going to be um, developing a masking and compositing um, series of, of online classes that I'm going to be um, doing for small groups of people. So for, you know, a little bit more hands-on um, guidance in learning how to do this sort of work. That's one thing. It's it's not on the front burner, but it's definitely on one of the burners on the on the creative stove. So that's going to be coming up soon too. Oh, that sounds really great! I can't wait to see that. Well, terrific. So um, it's been wonderful talking with you, Sean. I love seeing your work. I love hearing you talk. You're a great teacher and really an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Love being here. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I want to thank too the for those of you who don't know the Ninja beside me, <laughs> Jordan Orum. He's a great Canadian Maple Musketeer, and he's been busy keeping the chat engaged the whole night. And I just wanted to thank him. And um, yeah, thanks, Jordan. He's he's staying here on his way back out to the West Coast. He's made his way from Vancouver all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, and now he's going all the way back across Canada. So it's quite an adventure meeting. All kinds of great people, a lot of Google Plus people, and uh, yeah, telling stories along the way. Sounds That's like a cool. great trip. Hi, Jordan. <laughs> 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 all right, that wraps up another Photoshop show. Thank you all for being with us. If you want to catch the show again, you can do that on YouTube, either on um, on my YouTube channel, jkabili1, or Ron, where's your YouTube channel? I think it's just Ron Clifford, but I, I'm never sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know, YouTube is kind of mysterious. But I've been trying to yeah, gather yeah. all the Photoshop shows into one place there. And so if you can get yourself to jkabili1, I've got a whole playlist of them you know, all these luminaries, not only Sean, but we have John Paul Caponegro, we have Mark Johnson, we have Rich Harrington. Who else have we had, Ron? Gosh, so many. Oh, we had Tanya Rochat on. Um, who else have we had? We had Don Komarechka about the snowflakes. Yeah, we've, we've had quite a number of people on. 
That's right, and it's such it's such a great thing to have that, and it's great that YouTube uh, keeps those things for us, so we can all go back and look at them again and learn new techniques. Yeah, cool. All right then, bye everyone. Sandra, you want to say? Oh, before we go, Sandra Parlo has a great announcement. <laughs> Here's the great news. <laughs> no, I had already posted it on my page, but for those who didn't see it, I had made an announcement that I was just kind of excited about, um, that I'm going to be getting some of my work published So by Encore Art Group. So um, cool. that's kind of neat. You may see uh, some of my work in, in a home or in a frame store or a furniture store or... <laughs> in a hotel or something sometime. So keep your eyes peeled and see if you recognize anything. Yeah, excellent. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's really cool. That's really cool. All right, everybody. See you in two weeks, Tuesday nights at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time, and all the rest of us kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, signing off from the Photoshop show. Bye. Good night. See ya. Ciao. Bye. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Take it easy. Okay.